2008 trigger the anterior cingulate cortex of the brain, an area associated with feelings of guilt. When testing another type of packaging in matte beige colors with images of potatoes and other ingredients perceived as healthy, no activity of the anterior cingulate cortex was evident. Thus, Frito-Lay switched out of shiny packaging and opted for the matte design with healthy ingredients depictured instead, Burkitt 2009. Through EEG tests Frito-Lay also discovered that an important factor for consumers when choosing Cheetos over other snacks was the orange cheese dust sticking to the fingers after having touched the snack. The company took this knowledge and developed a campaign of TV commercials called The Orange Underground, with storylines evolving around pranks using the orange color cheese dust, Nobel 2013. The commercials were evaluated through both a conventional focus interview and through EEG tests and according to Ann Mukherjee, Frito-Lay chief marketing officer, the EEG tests proved much more accurate than the focus group. The focus group reacted negatively to a commercial in which a woman puts Cheetos in a dryer full of someone else's white clothes, as the group responded that they did not like the prank. However, when conducting EEG tests where subjects were shown the same commercial, the brain activity showed that the subjects actually really liked the commercial, Burkitt 2009. In fact, the Orange Underground campaign was granted the Grand Ogilvy Award from the Advertising Research Foundation in 2009, Nobel 2013. This commercial is a prime example of how neuromarketing might prove beneficial. It was assumed by Frito-Lay that participants of the focus group claimed not to like the commercial because they did not want to appear mean-spirited to the other 44 participants. However, when conducting the somewhat same interview of the brain, subjects did indeed like the commercial, Burkitt 2009. 4.4.3 Media Within the Business of Media Neuromarketing is often applied, for example, to test consumers' reactions to movie scripts or trailers, to see which parts of a website attract the eyes of the visitors or to see how people react to certain songs. It is, however, rare that movie studios, movie makers or others in the business willingly admit to the use of the practice, Randall 2011. Yuri Hansen, professor in psychology at Princeton University, argues that movies within certain genres such as horror and science fiction can be edited based on fMRI test results. The excitement of the viewers can hereby be maximized, based on what generates the most activity in the amygdala, which can be described as the emotional center controlling feelings such as disgust, anger, lust and fear, IBID hereby making it possible to create the most favorable building of suspense, particularly within the genres of horror and science fiction. In relation to the movie experiments, Hansen coined the term neurocinema, which is now often used in articles concerning this topic, IBID. Stephen Susco, writer of the successful horror movie Grudge, agrees with the potential of neurocinema. He considers the application of neuromarketing to movie creation as part of a Natural evolution of major studios trying to maximize profit while making the early creative development, script and storytelling process more scientific as opposed to just based on experience and instinct, IBID. 4.4.4 Predicting Popularity Scientist Gregory Burns and Sarah Moore set out to test the possibility of using fMRI to predict the popularity of pop songs. For this study, they conducted fMRI scans on 27 adolescents while they were listening to songs of seemingly unknown artists Burns, Moore 2012, p. 154. 45 before the scans were carried out, participants were asked to choose their preferred three genres out of six different ones, as categorized by MySpace. By using the online music network MySpace, the scientists were able to choose songs from artists unknown to the participants. Each participant would listen to 15 seconds clips, which included either the hook or the chorus of a total of 20 songs, within each of their three preferred genres. After each song clip, the participant would be asked to rate the song on a 1 to 5 star scale. Each participant was given a CD with their top 5 rated songs as an incentive for them to give their true opinions, OP.CIT. Pages 154-156. Three years after having conducted the experiments, the results were compared to the sales of the songs. As the artists and songs used in the study were relatively unknown, only a few of them were commercially successful after the three years. The results from the study showed a high degree of correlation between brain activity, especially within three reward-related brain regions and the success of the songs. The high activity in brain regions could not predict hit songs, however, songs entailing low activity in two of these brain regions were recognized as non-hits. The results did not point to any correlation between the participants' subjective ratings of the songs and their future sales. Thus, the results indicate that neural responses can be used to predict purchase decisions and cultural popularity in general, OP.CIT. 
pages 157-158. The above examples show that neuromarketing is used in several links of the production chain, both in relation to designing new products, redesigning existing products and to market them. The example of Frida Lay's experience with using both conventional research methods and neuroscience proves that consumers do not always express their actual thoughts and feelings when asked. However, this might not be intentionally since many of the unsaid feelings and thoughts lie within the subconsciousness. Accordingly, the neuroimaging of participants in the fMRI study on cultural popularity showed a higher degree of resemblance with the future hit songs than their subjective rankings. The findings of this study furthermore endorse the statements from Susco and Hansen, which argue that film studios will be able to maximize their profits by creating movies aligned with audience preferences. Below, we will now introduce some of the most 46 famous consulting companies and their approaches to neuromarketing, as several of the companies are mentioned throughout our thesis. 4.4.5 Neuromarketing Companies 4.4.5.1 Bright House The American advertising company Bright House was the first to introduce the word neuromarketing in a press release in 2002, announcing the creation of a business division using the neuroscientific method FMRA for marketing research. The company, however, quickly received criticism for having conflicting interests with Emory University and telling Commercial Alert to ask the Federal Office for Human Research Protections and the U.S. Senate to investigate their research. Shortly after the company was closed down, Fisher et al. 2010 p. 231. 4.4.5.2 Neurofocus Now Nielsen Consumer Neuroscience Neurofocus was an American neuromarketing company which was acquired by the worldwide market research company, the Nielsen Company, in 2008 and was thus renamed Nielsen Consumer Neuroscience. They use a combination of EEG and eye tracking, combined with traditional marketing research. To improve their research, Nielsen are currently developing the world's first wireless, dry, EEG headset, enabling research at many different locations, Nielsen 2014. 4.4.5.3 Millward Brown Millward Brown was founded in Britain and now has several locations in Europe, America, Asia, Middle East and Africa. The company combines eye tracking, facial coding and implicit measurement with traditional marketing research, Millward Brown 2014 C. The company uses what they call the implicit measurement technique, which they on their web page explain as a technique measuring subconscious reactions based on reaction time. Thus, measuring small reactions, which explicit research might not reveal, Millward Brown 2014 B. Among its customers are Johnson's Baby Line, Weight Watchers and Pantene Shampoo, Millward Brown 2014A. 47 4.4.5.4 Neurosense London-based Neurosense was founded by Gamma Calvert and was allegedly the first to conduct fMRI scans for commercial use, Neurosense 2013A. Apart from fMRI scans, Neurosense offers biometric measures and implicit reaction speed tests combined with traditional marketing research. The method most often applied by Neurosense is referred to as psychophysics and is a test that can be conducted online. The test measures consumers' subconscious responses to brands along with their implicit response time by presenting words, brand attributes or images on a computer and measuring respondents' reaction time, Neurosense 2013C. This online psychophysical method has been validated alongside fMRI scans, from which highly correlated results of the two approaches have been found. IBID. Neurosense lists several famous brands among their clients, i.e. BBC, Coca-Cola, Ford, Heinz, Intel and Del Oral, Neurosense 2013B. Neurosense is also known for collaborating with Lindstrom on the BioLOGY study, however, the company does not refer to this collaboration on their website. 4.4.5.5 NeuroInsight NeuroInsight was founded by Professor Richard Silverstein in 2005, operates in the USA, UK, Germany and Australia and offers neuromarketing services specializing in the field of marketing communications, NMSBA 2013. The company uses neuroimaging technology to measure how the brain responds to communications and hereby measure the affect on consumers from a piece of advertising. NeuroInsight uses the technology Steady State Topography, SST, which records and measures electrical signals at the scalp in order to build a second-by-second -second picture of activity in the brain, NeuroInsight 2013b. It is stated on the company website that NeuroInsight was a key contributor to Lindstrom's book BioLOGY and that GlaxoSmithKline, Nestle, combining acute accent, Mini, and RTL are amongst their clients, NeuroInsight 2013A. As seen from the descriptions above, 
The approaches to neuromarketing and the technologies used within the field vary within the companies. Thus, there are 48 differences in what each consulting company offers and what they and their customers are able to conclude based on the results of the findings. A shared feature is, however, that they all seem to be combining the new techniques with traditional market research techniques. 4.5 The most famous neuromarketing study The most famous study conducted within neuromarketing research and neuroimaging is a taste test with a chemically very similar drinks, Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola, a test that is also emphasized in all of our empirical data, Lindstrom 2000 AB, P. 25, R. E. Lai, Burns 2010, P. 288, Plasman et al., 2012, P. 26. This study in many ways proves how difficult it is to decipher what consumers really think, how consumers do not themselves know what they really think, and how careful companies and advertisers should be before jumping to conclusions. In 1975 Pepsi initiated a marketing campaign called the Pepsi Challenge. The campaign, which was running for several years, took place in American shopping centers where people were invited to participate in a blind taste of two colas, Pepsi and Coca-Cola, and hence state their preference. The conclusion was that more than 50% of Americans preferred Pepsi-Cola in favor of Coca-Cola. Not at all happy with the results, Coca-Cola decided to conduct their own test, however, it did not turn out in Coca-Cola's favor. 57% of the tasters preferred Pepsi, Gladwell 2005, p. 156. These results combined with an increase in Pepsi's market share were surprising news to the Coca-Cola company, as they were spending much more on advertising per year than the Pepsi brand did, OP.CIT. Pages 155-156. Thus, in the beginning of the 1980s, the Coca-Cola company began their own research on the taste of their product and developed a new version of the original Coca-Cola, New Coke. The New Coke was a little lighter and sweeter and closer to the taste of Pepsi-Cola. According to New Blind Taste, consumers preferred the New Coke to the original, which made Coca-Cola certain that this product would help them gain market shares from Pepsi. Nevertheless, the launch of New Coke was disastrous. Consumers protested across America, wanting their original Coca-Cola back. Furthermore, Pepsi 49 never actually increased their market shares as indicated by the results of the taste test, OP.CIT. Pages 156-158. A reason for the surprising results can be attributed to the fact that a sip taste similar to the blind taste conducted in relation to the Pepsi challenge will yield different results, and if people are to drink a larger amount. This is due to the fact that our taste buds often prefer the sweeter product, Pepsi, when having a sip. However, when it comes to an entire can or case the less sweet product, Coca-Cola is more often the preferred choice. Thus, when conducting an experiment like the above, it is important to decide whether the results of a sip or the intake of a large amount is of interest, OP.CIT. P. 159. In relation to neuromarketing, these results prove that consumers do not always know what they want, even when asked. When asked through blind taste, consumers actually preferred New Coke to the original. However, when the product was launched, consumers were not interested in buying it. Quite contrarily, they protested against it. Furthermore, the experiment underpins the importance of marketers knowing what they actually want to test. According to Marty, combining acute accent, Nez, author of The Consumer Mind, 2012, consumers' minds can be differentiated within four categories. Between what they think, what they say, what they do, and what they feel, Marty, combining acute accent, Nez, 2012, p. 5. Marty, combining acute accent, Nez, emphasizes that a critical point of traditional marketing research is that Consumers contradict themselves, saying what they want, but doing what they feel, I bid. Thus, Marty, combining acute accent, Nez argues that neuromarketing will help marketers acquire more objective information from and about consumers than through use of traditional marketing tools such as surveys and interviews. Marty, combining acute accent, Nez proposes that the most efficient way to apply neuroscience in relation to marketing is through a combination of qualitative, quantitative and neuroscience research, as they hereby will complement and support each other, yielding the richest information possible, OP.CIT. P. 6. 4.5.1 Adding neuroimaging to the Pepsi challenge inspired by the Pepsi challenge, a group of scientists set out to research how behavioral preferences for food and beverages could be affected by sensory variables, 50 hedonic states, expectations, semantic priming and social context almost 30 years after the original Pepsi challenge test, McClure et al. 2004, p. 379.
67 participants took part in the study, which included a combination of simple taste tests, both blind and semi-blind tests, as well as event-related fMRI scans, OP.CIT. Pages 379-380, the scientists wanted to investigate the behavioral and neural responses to the two types of cola when these were presented anonymously and when participants knew which brand they were tasting, 